Hello everyone um, and welcome to our first webinar for our series of Customer Centricity Month 2023. It's really wonderful to have so many of you signed up for today and I can see our numbers going up already which is really fantastic. Um, so before I hand over to today's speakers Stu and Max and while people are still tuning in I just wanted to say hello and introduce exactly what Customer Centricity Month is. So I'm Lauren, I work in the marketing and events team at CX Partners. And at CX Partners, we work with organizations to drive growth, unlock opportunities, and enable teams to work together more effectively. We do this through our research programs, user-centered design, and embedding a culture of customer centricity within organizations. So last year, we started Customer Centricity Month as a way of creating dedicated content that's all about the value of user-centered design and putting customers at the heart of your organizations. So this year, we're running this the series again, but we're focusing on how customer centricity can make organizations more resilient and enable them to thrive when external conditions can make it challenging. So this focus came from some research that we conducted earlier this year into how turbulent environments may affect organizations and their ability to remain customer centric. We're just about to launch a white paper with our findings from the study, and today Stu will be looking into some of the strategies for prioritization that came out of it. Also, as attendees of this webinar, we'll be giving you all exclusive early access to the paper, so I'll give you a link to this um, at the end and you'll be able to download it. So, as I mentioned earlier, this is the first webinar of the month. We'll be running four further sessions, all at 11am every Wednesday throughout November. So, if you haven't already, make sure you sign up for the rest of them. I'll pop a link in the chat in a moment, um, but now I'm going to hand over to today's speakers. So Stu Taylor is CX Partners Practice Director. He's going to be leading today's session, focusing on the findings of the white paper that I mentioned. We're also joined by our brilliant guest speaker, Max McShane, who is the head of digital at Octopus Energy. Um, Max pioneered digital marketing at Octopus and um, he conducted many of the in-house campaigns that helped see the company grow from a startup to one of the largest energy suppliers in the UK. So being part of this team that helped um, that helped establish Octopus's customer-centric outlook, uh, Max now consults on Octopus's global expansion, sharing the strategies that help them to not only survive, but um, thrive through challenging times. Um, there'll be time at the end for questions, but please do add them to the Q&A or the chat throughout the webinar, and we'll run through as many as possible at the end. Um, so Stu, I'll hand over to you now. Thanks, Lauren. Um, hi, everyone. And yeah, thanks again for coming today. Um, I'm going to begin by getting you to cast your mind back to the start of the year. So there are a lot of headlines like this. The UK was starting to shrink. Um, the, the economy was starting to shrink. And the World Bank was warning that we were getting close to a global recession. And although that recession hasn't happened, times are still challenging. You know, interest rates are rising, prices are rising, businesses are hiring less. And so at Six Partners, we ran a study to understand how organisations may be affected. Specifically, we wanted to learn about prioritisation. We knew that in, in challenging times, resources are more scarce, and that might be money, people or time. And so that it would be more important than ever to make good prioritisation decisions. And we wanted to understand how organizations were doing that. So we sent out a survey to organizations across utilities, financial services, public services, and, and more. Um, and we interviewed a bunch of people as well. And so today, what I want to do is share what we found out from our prioritization study. Um, and the first thing that we learned is that people were actually more optimistic than we expected. And that's because we've all been through challenging times very recently with COVID. Um, as one person told us, COVID was like a boot camp for everybody. So people had developed strategies that allowed them to survive back then. And so now people are feeling more prepared. And we found that people had developed or were already using one of three main strategies to prioritize their work. Play it safe, stick to your guns and break it down. So I'm going to run through each strategy and explain what it is, but also what's needed to make it work. Um, but before I go into each strategy, I just want to highlight how things are different now to the days of COVID. So back then, people were aiming to survive. They were kind of treading water. But as uncertainty is now more and more the normal situation, organisations need to do more. 
they need to thrive. They need to learn how to maintain a competitive edge when times are tough. And if you're thinking like a competitive athlete, you need to stock up on energy. And we believe customer centricity is a bit like an energy bar. It gives organizations this power to thrive. And so that's what I want you to take away today, that no matter which of the three strategies you, your organization applies, customer centric behaviors will still will, will help you thrive rather than just survive. OK, so the first prioritization strategy <clears throat> is play it safe. Playing it safe means prioritizing work that has a clear short term impact. And that means sacrificing earlier stage research, development, and any ambitious initiatives, and really anything that seems too risky. As one of our survey respondents wrote, the goal is the quickest route to make money. So here's a hypothetical example. So if you imagine a price comparison site, um, and they spotted an opportunity to help customers navigate car financing options. So helping people to decide between you know, confusing options like PCPs, HP, PCH, and, and loans. Um, however, their strategy is to play it safe. And although this car finance service may be a promising avenue, it feels risky in the short term. So they pause the project. And instead, they focus on safe ways to make money. So they look to ensure they look to improve their main insurance comparison journeys, or they might focus on registration journeys for new customers. Or they might look for ways to cross sell their existing products. But what they're doing is sacrificing the potential of that long term growth because of the short term risk of the new service. And instead, they focus on safer near term ROI. So we observed two main courses of playing it safe. Um, in our survey, we found that the organizations who are more likely to prioritize shorter term work were also less comfortable with experimentation. And that makes sense if we're talking about risk averse organizations. The second course of playing it safe was the focus on short term commercial returns over longer term growth. So in our survey, we ask people to choose from a long list which were the most important factors when they make prioritization decisions. And the same group who were prioritizing work with less risk also ranked potential revenue and cost reduction as the most important factors. And I think this is the issue with this prioritization strategy, that it can lead to a non-customer centric culture where you disproportionately focus on short-term commercial factors over longer-term customer satisfaction. But why is that a problem? So I'm going to pick on insurance now. So sorry to any insurers in the audience. I know a lot of you are doing good work. Um, anyway, for those of you as well that haven't seen Groundhog Day, the guy on the left is Ned Ryerson, and he's an insurance salesman, and he's trying to sell Bill Murray's character, the guy on the right, um, some life insurance. So insurers are a good example of um, historically prioritizing short-term commercial gain over longer-term satisfaction for customers. So there are practices like price walking, where you gradually increase the price of a customer's premium over time, while at the same time you give new customers a better deal. Um, and there's sludge practices where you make it harder, as an example, you make it harder for customers to leave you than to join you. And that's not just insurance that that happens, you know, telcos often do the same. Um, and these kind of tactics, they'll work for, for a time, but they're not sustainable. You know, in financial services, at least, the regulator is cracking down on this kind of thing. But the reason that everyone should watch out for prioritizing short term commercials is that it opens you up for disruption um, from someone who prioritizes customer satisfaction. So this is Marshmallow Insurance, and their name crops up a lot if you speak to um, people in insurance. And what makes them different is that they're really focused on customers, and particularly customers that have been ignored by other insurers, um, like people that have just moved to the UK. So they're making insurance easier and more affordable for them, and they're building a customer base who really trust them, you know, as you can see from the Trustpilot scores. And they're valued at over $1.25 billion. 
So hopefully this shows you that if you just focus on short-term commercial gain, you're, you're kind of ripe for disruption. And later, you'll hear from Max about how similar was happening in the energy market and Octopus disrupted it. Additionally, we found that focusing on long-term customer satisfaction doesn't mean that you have to give up on commercial returns. So in 2022, we ran another customer centricity study. And in that, we were looking at the differences between organizations that were highly mature in terms of customer centricity and those that were low maturity. And we saw how the highly customer centric organizations were seeing around 8% more growth. So you can probably tell, I don't think playing it safe is the best strategy because it can lead to non-customer centric mindsets. But if you, choose, if you do choose to adopt it, trying to remain customer centric can still give you power. So in the short term, user research can help risk averse organizations be more certain about the smaller changes they plan to make. But more importantly, it's a really powerful reminder about who you're trying to serve. So you'll see the importance of the customer relationship and what you need to do to maintain that trust. As someone else told me, it's, it's like an empathy injection. So even if you're making short-term tactical decisions, hopefully you'll avoid damaging that longer-term relationship. Okay, so the next strategy is sticking to your guns. And this means maintaining priorities, but shifting how you might deliver them. So you're still doing the same things because you believe they're the right things to do, but maybe with less resources than expected. So that might be less headcount or less budget. So things might end up taking a bit longer. Um, and that applies to longer term initiatives too, because the organization believes those initiatives are needed to remain competitive. So an example of this is Netflix's um, new gaming platform. So if they were playing it safe, they probably double down on their TV and film streaming. Um, they maybe focus on how to get people to upgrade their membership plan. But instead, they've been building out a games library and they're posting jobs for their first big budget blockbuster game. So their big initiative is to become this gaming giant and that's what they're sticking to. Another example is Hertz's electric um, vehicle rental service or EV. Um, Again, it's potentially risky, you know, will customers be happy to rent an EV? Um, and it's large scale, you know, they need to think about all the infrastructure and logistics associated with renting out EVs. But they must believe that this is important to remain competitive. They've invested in a fleet of over 50,000 electric vehicles, and so they're sticking again to their guns. We spoke to Andreas Lopez Yasenj, sorry, Andreas, if I pronounced that wrong. Um, but we spoke to him about prioritization at Visa and he explained how they can't afford to play it safe. Visa has long running programs that take a year or more. And he said that if these stopped, it would hamper their competitive strategy. And then he said, you can't take your foot off the accelerator. Otherwise you end up getting left behind. And so Visa is another example of sticking um, sticking to their guns. And Andreas went on to explain that to make that strategy work, um, to be able to stick to your priorities, you first need to be really clear about what those priorities are. So he told us that it's paramount to set expectations by defining exactly what you're going to do. And we saw similar in our prioritization survey. So we found that organizations who thought that prioritization was working well for them, were more likely to have a widely understood mission and they were more likely to have a clear understanding of senior leadership's priorities. The second thing needed to make this strategy work is a focus on outcomes. So what you want to achieve through the work you're doing rather than outputs. And that's because it allows you to be more flexible with how you achieve your goals when resources available change. I won't go into much detail on outcomes over outputs, but here's a quick um, tactical example. So if you imagine you're one of these um, veg box delivery services and you want to reassure customers about when their delivery will arrive. Um, so initially you might have plans to implement an Amazon type delivery tracker complete with a live map like here. But then with less resources, 
you maybe need to look at using SMS alerts and that will get you, get you some way to achieving the same kind of outcomes. But if you're going to stick to your guns and you're dealing with big initiatives, probably the biggest thing this strategy needs is confidence. You need to believe that you have the right priorities if you're going to stick to them when things get uncertain. But confidence isn't the same thing as arrogance. Confidence should be grounded in evidence. And again, that's where customer centricity and user research comes in again. So organizations should gather data and insight that will either prove or disprove the priorities that you're laying out. And in our 2022 study, we found that those highly mature customer centric organizations were more likely to gather quantitative and qualitative research. And so they were using that to help them gain confidence. Okay, so the third and final strategy is break it down. And this strategy prioritizes longer term initiatives, but breaks those down into deliverable experiments. So a bit like sticking to your guns, organizations continue to prioritize those longer term initiatives because they need to keep that competitive advantage. But rather than working behind closed doors and incubating those initiatives, they break them down into work that can be delivered earlier. And that allows them to learn and iterate. So really they're applying agile principles to these larger initiatives. And the reason why we have maximum octopus energy with us today is that octopus really exemplify this approach. Um, octopus, if you don't know, is a renewable energy supplier, and they have a, a ambition to be a one hundred. They have an ambition for a one hundred percent green energy system. Um, but to achieve that, there's a bit of a challenge around what you do when um, the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. Um, so somehow you need to introduce flexibility into the energy system. And that's what Octopus wants to do. It's a, it's a bold ambition and a big initiative, but Octopus are finding ways to learn about how to do this through different trials. And Max will sp speak more about this later, um, but one example I wanted to touch on was their power loop service. And this is where an electric car can store power in its battery, and then it can supply it back later on to the house or the grid when there's, um, during times of peak demand. So Octopus trialed that by working with a single charge provider and then Octopus employees, friends and families who had electric vehicles. So it's a, a nice example of breaking it down. So I want to look at what you need to do to make that strategy work. Firstly, the experiments you run should be considered and intentional. You know, otherwise you risk just throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks, which wastes time and resources. So you need to have a clear understanding of the problems you're trying to solve, and you need to be clear about the hypotheses you're testing. Now, how are you going to know if you're successful or not? How will you use your findings? And at Six Partners, we often use this test card format on the right here from Strategizer, um, and that just helps us be really intentional with the experiments that we're running. And the next thing you need to do to make this strategy work is to empower teams. And that's because if you want teams to work in quicker, shorter cycles, to break things down, then they, need, then they need the autonomy to do that. And that in turn requires clear priorities from leadership again, but also a culture of trust. So this is Octopus's CEO, Greg Jackson. And Max told me about how Greg says that you should assume that people come to work to do a good job. And so you should do everything you can to empower them to do that good job. So I think that that shows that um, culture of trust there. The final thing needed to make this strategy work is iteration. So if you're going to break things down, you can't just launch a first version and an MVP and forget about it. You need to continually improve so that you eventually reach your bigger ambition. So let me give you an example of that. Um, this is Tesco's Wish service. It allows customers to order food and get it delivered in as little as 20 minutes. Um, and that's meant to be great for last minute food purchases. And that's available in over a thousand stores. <clears throat> but it's not how it started. Um, 
this is Tesco Express in Willenhall Road in Wolverhampton. And this was the first store that Tesco experimented with Wush. Um, and they worked with a curry, courier company called Stuart, which I think is a great name. Um, and they they allowed customers living in certain postcodes um, to select a one hour delivery just using Tesco's normal website or app. And that's how they could break things down. But they didn't stop there. Um, since then, they've grown the number of stores that they offer the service in, but they've also iterated on the service. So they've added 15 minute delivery window estimates and they've added live tracking of the rider on the map and other things. And it's meant that the customer satisfaction scores for that service has increased by 30%. Once again, this is where customer centricity and customer research comes in. So when you're iterating, it's really crucial. You need customer research to listen to what worked and what didn't, and you need to be able to explain why. So customer research will help you to learn and build upon the things that you've broken down so that you can then go on to achieve your big competitive initiative. Okay, so I'll just recap those three strategies. Playing it safe is about prioritizing work that has a clear short-term impact. That happens because organizations focus on nearer-term revenue and cost savings, but they deprioritize early stage R&D and longer term initiatives. <clears throat> Sorry. And I think this strategy should be avoided if possible. Firstly, it leads to being uncompetitive in the future, but it can also lead to a non-customer centric mindset. But customer research can help here. It can help risk averse organizations to validate their plans. But more importantly, it focuses people on the importance of the customer relationship and encourages that longer term thinking. Sticking to your guns is where you stick with your existing priorities, but perhaps shift how you deliver them. So that could mean doing the same work with less people or less budget. And that might mean things take longer, or it might mean that you need to adapt how you achieve your outcomes. And if you adopt this strategy, you need customer centricity and research so that you can be confident that you've prioritized the right things. And through testing with customers, you can check you're building them in the right way so that they'll deliver the value that you expect. And finally, break it down. So this is where you still prioritize those longer term initiatives, but rather than incubating them behind closed doors, you break them down into things that you can deliver and learn from. And this requires customer centric behaviors so that you can be intentional with your experiments. Um, you want to understand problems before running experiments, trying to fix them. And you need to listen to customers so that you can learn from the experiments and iterate on them so that you can work towards that ambitious goal. So hopefully adopting the right strategy and remaining customer centric can help you remain competitive and win. Okay, so um, I talked quite a bit there about Octopus, specifically in the third um, strategy of breaking it down. Um, and also back in 2022, Octopus were our top scoring customer centric organization. So I'm really excited and interesting to hear from Max about how Octopus is so customer centric and how they break things down as well. So I'll hand over to you, Max. Thank you, Stuart. And thank you, Lauren. Um, I only have 20 minutes and I want to leave lots of time at the end for questions. So I'm going to jump straight in. Um, so yes, Octopus Energy are an energy retailer supplying gas and renewable electricity to businesses and homes across the UK and globally. And maybe your first reaction to hearing someone talk about the energy industry for a while wasn't a positive one. And I would forgive you for that. I, six years ago, I had the exact same response. I think there was a lot of negative sort of connotations around the industry at the time, just from personal experience, you know, being on hold for a long time having really poor customer experience. So when Rebecca, the CMO of Octopus, called me up, she found on LinkedIn that I was looking for a new challenge and I specifically outlined it. I want to look, work for a startup. Uh, she, she asked me how I'd like to come work for an energy company. And um, my genuine response at the time was I, I couldn't think of anything worse. It's the opposite of what, <laughs> what I was looking for. Um, and she laughed 
And she thought that was a great response and exactly what she was looking for because Octopus understood this and we're really looking to disrupt that and, uh, and change it. Um, so I jumped on board and you know, since then we have grown to be the UK's most awarded energy supplier. We have numerous accolades, but I think some of the most impressive has been which recommended, so it's six years in a row, times 100 most influential companies and we're quite proud to say we're one of the best places to work is voted for by uh, Glassdoor. So yeah, we've seen some <clears throat> impressive, impressive growth over six, seven years. Um, and that continued during COVID and when we locked down, uh, we continued to grow. We, you'll see the plateau there at the beginning of the energy crisis. This was everybody in the industry basically had to close their doors. The price of us to buy energy was seven, eight times at one point, more expensive than it was for us to legally sell it on. So every single energy customer closed their, closed their doors. You'll see a little peak just before uh, we closed our doors. And that's because uh, we kept them open for customers as, as long as possible, uh, looking after them, giving them a good deal. And we were the last energy supplier to actually close our doors, but eventually the inevitable, the inevitable ha happened. But during this time, we continued to focus on customers, taking care of them, looking after them. And, you know, word got around. And when it came to opening the doors again, you can see it was like opening the floodgates. People couldn't wait to, to join Octopus Energy. And as of today, we're still gaining nine customers for every one customer uh, that leaves. So they, it's great to say um, we continue, continue to grow. So what have, we, what have we done to achieve this? Um, and I think I Stuart quoted Andreas saying, you know, you really need to be crystal clear about what your priorities are. And at Octopus, it really comes down to these two KPIs and everything we do, all the strategies we put in place, um, the things we decide to build and do always come back to, will it improve customer love and will it improve customer growth? And this is etched into everybody at Octopus, no matter what department, all decisions come back to this. Um, and this is ultimately how we prioritize everything. So. Customer growth is fairly easy to define. Customer love is probably a little more vague. So what do we mean when we say customer love? Uh, it's ultimately anything that prompts a customer to stop and just think, wow, you know, no other supplier would do this for me. So what everything, and we're really insistent that, you know, if any idea put forward isn't going to create this thing that's ultimately worth talking about and ultimately gets people thinking this it's not likely to sort of go ahead um and and we believe you know if we do this right then marketing and sales becomes superfluous you know if everybody's saying well about the brand word of mouth will do will do the job for us so customer growth is easy to measure uh, customer love there's a number of things we look at consistently to make sure where you know doing this right and the whole business is doing this correctly uh, one of the things we ask customers is a, a sort of product market fit survey and this is where we ask customers how disappointed they would be if they could no longer be an octopus energy customer uh, this is basically a five point answer from very disappointed to very happy and obviously we're looking for people to be disappointed not to be part of the brand anymore um and it's reported that Typically, 40% is considered a good score, uh, but it was slightly published when they scored 51%. And they published an article that really said, you know, if you're not, if, if you know, if more than half of your customers aren't, you know, desperately wanting to be with you, then you're really not open to that exponential growth. Uh, so you need to be over 50% at least. And they were almost a gold, a gold standard for, for a long time. Um, I'm quite pleased to say when we did it for the first time, we scored more than 50%, which is a great result. Uh, but I think uh, the interesting thing is that, you know, our score pre-COVID, uh, post-COVID was much better than our score pre-COVID. And again, that all comes back to looking after the customer, prioritizing customer love. Just a couple of other things we look at to measure that customer love. 
Uh, one is um, we do YouGov surveys uh, on trust. Uh, so you can see up to percentage on the right here. The pink is how people who trust us. Uh, the blue is essentially people who don't trust uh, the brand. So again, proud to say we're ahead of the game there. And not just against the incumbent energy suppliers, but even more of the more modern sort of challenger suppliers like uh, Bulb and Ovo. Um, and then the next one is NPS, which is a you know, net promoter score common across a lot of industries. Um, and again, really proud here to say we're way in front of even second place, the second highest. In fact, 39 points higher uh, than the industry average, which is the biggest difference in any company in any sector. So okay, I'm not just telling you all this to, uh, to brag about Octopus. Um, I'm going to talk about what we've done to achieve this. And I wanted to show you this first because a lot of people often think that our, our way of working is quite radical, quite crazy. But actually, if you look at the results, then you can't really argue with them. So to achieve this, there's a number of things we look at, a number of things that sort of Stuart touched on already. And it's all based around achieving this, sort of building this culture that helps us maximize efficiency, effectiveness, and, and enables the whole team to sort of bias towards action, doing things and getting things out and testing them and learning from them. And um, with every action that we do, always coming back to the goal of improving customer love and improving customer growth. So these three things are empowering employees, those rapid iterations and that breaking it down that sort of Stuart already mentioned. And I'm gonna jump in and talk about each one uh, a little bit, uh, starting with empowering employees. So I think the mistake that a lot of people make is that a lot of blame gets put on the employees. And as we mentioned, Greg talks earlier that actually nobody wants to come to work to do a bad job. And it's not the employee's willingness to do a good job that's the issue. It's usually the terrifyingly dated business models and the platforms that the companies use that inadvertently sort of stomp out employees' enthusiasm and sort of lowers that morale. So you have, you know, most businesses out there have really bright, intelligent people who will be working on the brand to bring in customers um, only for the customers to get trapped in this terrible experience caused by this big, horrible business model or some old data platform. Um, so our way of tackling that, um, again, if we lead from the assumption that employees want to do a good job, then what can we do to enable them to do their best work? Um, and everybody knows, again, customer love and customer growth are the priorities. So giving the freedom to focus on that. How do we do that? So empowering employees is really three, three main things. Then there's a whole bunch of stuff, but I think these are the, these are the big ones. Breaking down silos uh, within the business, I think is really important. Um, so that would be sort of physically within the office, but also with technology as well. So especially within the energy industry, we have, I mean, it, typically you would have a whole bunch of different platforms for billing, one for energy flows, one for complaints, one for payments. And there'd be a team looking after that, and each one would have a different platform behind a different login and a different password. And you couldn't, you can't jump over from one to the other and easily get to it. So at Octopus, we created our own platform called Kraken. I'm not going to talk too much about that today. It's a whole other topic. But essentially, what this allows us to do is break down those silos where everybody within the industry can almost do everything uh, for a customer. And what this allows us to do is when somebody calls in with a problem, we can answer the phone pretty quick. And the person who answers the phone can do 95% of the things that a customer might ask. So you're not being passed and put on hold from one person to another, having to explain yourself to a new person and what your problem is over and over again, frustrating the customer and taking a long, long time to organize. Usually you can, everybody has access to everything. You can jump in and do whatever's necessary to help that person. Uh, this helps minimize dependencies, um, but we also focus on this, again, across the business, giving everybody access to everything. So an, an example of this might be, for example, the data team and the Fed team and the marketing team all work very closely together. 
and marketing can access the data platforms. Data have set up things so that even if you're not knowledgeable in SQL and how to query databases, you can copy and paste something into the data platform to get the data you want to pull out from that customer research. Maybe it's a send list. Maybe you want to find out who's had the most complaints recently, et cetera. Um, and we can just go in and do that. And so again, it's all about anybody being able to do anything, almost, not quite anything. And I'll come to that, <laughs> come to that later. Um, the other thing is sort of removing this consensus culture. I think a lot of businesses spend a lot of time in meetings, discussing options, trying to get the whole team to decide on what the best thing is. Again, we, we want to completely remove this. If everyone's focused on customer growth and customer love, and an individual has a has a good idea and the access to go do it, then they can run and go do it. There's no there's no command line, you know, you don't have to go the chain of command, you don't have to get it signed off by somebody else. Get a second pair of eyes on it is always a good idea. But again, it doesn't have to be by a senior person. It's not a top-down sort of organization. Anybody can run and uh, do some great stuff. So I just want to give you a couple of examples that when you open that up, you sort of brilliant customer love ideas that can come to light and sort of happen. A couple of my favorites to start with, I think this was a, there was a senior marketing person who just had the thought, you know, instead of spending tens of thousands of pounds on pushing ads out on the internet or across billboards everywhere, what if we just spent that money on sending our most vulnerable customers uh, electric blankets for over the winter? Um, and because of the way we're sort of laid out, um, again, we're very close, the marketing team are very close to the data team and the development team that, you know, this was sort of just set out in the open in the office. There wasn't a meeting to discuss how we, how we might do this. Um, but someone in data like overheard it. I was like, yeah, you probably want to check that that's, you know, electric blankets, you know, use energy. So is it actually going to be beneficial? Um, and then that data person just picked it up and had a look and did, did the research and came back, uh, the same day, I think they literally walked out to the high street, bought an electric blanket, came back to the office, plugged it in, had a look for an hour. It turned out these specific type of electric blankets cost four pence an hour to run. And that's significantly cheaper than heating the whole house uh, for an hour. Um, so we, we ran with this. We bought 10,000 electric blankets. I think there was a shortage uh, for a while because I think other people, other companies saw us doing this and decided to jump on it as well. Um, well, we tested this. We had a look at everybody who received an electric blanket. We, we looked at their usage the year before versus now. We also had a control group of people who didn't uh, have an electric blanket and look at their usage the year before versus now. And for those who received an electric blanket, they saved on average up to 20% on their energy bills over the winter, which uh, added up to about 30 30 300 pounds uh for the year which is quite a significant saving and as you can see this is just one example but the press that we got off the back of it actually was much greater than and much cheaper than the ads we would have bought if we were to do adverts within those same newspapers and publications um so th that one came from a senior member but again everybody has access to, to everything and can launch anything they want, so long as it's focused on customer love and customer growth. So I want to try an example that came from one of our uh, junior operators, uh, one of our become energy specialists who talk to customers on the phone and answer emails. Um, and one of them just came off the phone with somebody who basically had, had been through a pretty rough time. Um, and this person came off the back of it, just compelled to send them some flowers and again, they didn't have to run up the chain of command. They didn't have to get finance to sign off the cost of spend the flowers. They turned around to their team leader. I was like, can I, can I send this person some flowers? They've been through a really rough time. Team leader gave them their business card to go buy some flowers and send them off. Um, this isn't actually the first example of a, of a response we got. This is just one I found. Um, but because we're all very close to customers, uh, one of the developers saw one of the responses this person getting the flowers and thought this was a great idea and went over and spoke to the operations team and said do you know what we could do uh, we could add a button within kraken which is our customer you know management system uh within kraken so anybody has access to do this much quickly in the future so he went away and 
I think within two days, I think the hardest part or the most timely part, not necessarily difficult, was uh, getting that partnership um, with someone where the florist who was happy for us to send them, uh, you know, orders. Obviously, they're happy getting somebody to send them orders on a regular basis. Um, so, yeah, I'll just, it's two days. And again, it wasn't something that had to go into a pipeline. It wasn't something that had to go into a sprint week down the line. It was done, you know, the same week that we caught the supply. The only rules we've stuck to this and given sort of the operational team is you can't use it to win favor. Uh, you can't use it to apologize for a mistake you've made. It's only when there's those situations when we have to talk to people who are, you know, have a loved one in the hospital. Makes a lot of times we talk to people where we'll talk to a partner, someone who usually looks after the bills, but they're you know, ill or not very well, so they're picking it up now. Um, and at the click of a button now we can send the And I think that's really great. And these sort of things are the sort of things that just wouldn't exist if we had to, you know, get them signed off by a senior member. It, they just get done almost instantly. Um, so yeah, I've just shown a little bit, but we, we don't, we really don't plan projects months, uh, quarters or years in advance. We respond to customers. We respond to the market, the economy, society, almost on a daily, more likely a weekly basis. Um, and we do this to get out, get projects out pretty quick. These rapid iterations that Stuart sort of talked about. Um, and there's a, there's a way that the team needs to be set up for this to work. And one of them is bringing teams much closer together uh, and working really closely. Um, it, before before lockdown, we had people working from home. You know, there were days when you just need to plug in and crack on and do some work. But actually, we encourage people to be in the office uh, quite often because of this closeness to each other and uh, to the customer. Um, that intense collaboration, again, it, across departments is really, really important. We don't have big meeting rooms in the office. This is one of the meeting rooms you can see. I mean, it's quite small. It's usually for like a one-on-one -on -one personal conversation. If it's business related, we have it out in the open so everybody can hear it and everybody can chip in. Uh, and the idea is that we can do this continuous deployment, get stuff out that are gonna improve customer growth and improve customer love uh, pretty quickly. Um, and when I talk about bringing teams closer to the customer, that means talking to the customers. Everybody within the company, whether you're in finance, marketing, have had days where it's pens down and just talk to customers. As we get bigger, uh, there's less of that. Uh, but still, I just wanted to show this, which is an example of the marketing team talking to customers. So this is this showed you over the last 12 months, uh, it gives you a tally of uh, the emails participated in. And participated in means you replied and responded uh, to a customer. So as you can see, this is a list of all the different kinds of people within the marketing department. And it's led by the most senior people. So you've got a couple of people on the board of directors here. Rebecca, who was uh, the CMO who gave me a call six years ago I talked about. And Pete Miller was one of the founders. He's the fifth one down there. And between them, they've spoken to thousands and thousands of customers. They know, they've got the finger on the pulse and they know exactly what uh, customer pain points are and what we can fix. And this is a common theme. We'll have it out in the open. We'll talk about it and fix it uh, there and then. And just running through them, you can see it's across different. So we've got a hardware tech guy, copywriters, myself, uh, a digital uh, a PR person, a designer. And at the bottom there, we've got a, a, a contractor who only works two days a week. Uh, but even they are forced to jump in and, and talk to customers. And then finally, uh, we have Break It Down, which uh, Stuart touched on quite a lot. Um, and I think ultimately for these to work, it's all about running experiments that you can get out cheaply, quickly, and if they go wrong, have very minimal impact on customers. Uh, and while we're doing this, it's, it's important to have these sort of clear goals and context. As, as Stuart mentioned, we run projects that are obviously massive and we can't do within the week. So we have to break them down and say, okay, what do we need to know? Uh, what do we need to learn in order for us to do a good job at this. So it, we make clear of the context of the thing this week we want to learn. Uh, and it's important to understand and get the results and 
know what works before we do the next thing and scale it. So I have a couple of examples. I'm lying, I have one example of a really big project we've done. So saving sessions is one of our largest and longest running projects. Uh, it's essentially a tool to help as well and eventually eradicate the dependency on fossil fuels. Basically when it's not just when there's not enough wind and enough sun, but often when it's really sunny uh, and really windy uh, and if there's not a lot of demand, the people in out enjoying the sun, uh, you know, the grid can get really scared that it's going to overpower the grid and cause a lot of blackouts. So they pay generators, renewable generators to turn off. Um, so we thought actually, what if we just pay people to help us take it off or put it on when, when we need it? Uh, so same sessions, it's, it, it was this huge, sophisticated thing where you've got these really complicated calculations. There's a, there's a lot of automated comms for multiple scenarios. We've built a reward system. Obviously not something we can do within a week. Um, we had 100, 700,000 people, customers take part in this. It was over a, three months over the winter. We had those people shifted 200 gigawatts of energy that's equivalent to a hundred million charging a hundred million iPhones or just short of being able to send two DeLoreans back to the future. So it's a huge amount of energy and customers saved over 5 million pounds. So obviously this is not something we can just turn out in a week. Um, but actually it didn't take as long as it, as you might think. And that's because we broke it down over time, looking at the individual things, running trials and different tests. Um, so just to go through it, the first thing we asked ourselves is, okay, will people actually use more energy if we offer it for free? What's the quickest, cheapest way we can test this? Well, because smart meters are brilliant, uh, we can actually look at people's usage quite live uh, by the hour, by the minute. So one Christmas, we said, hey, we just sent an email out to smart meters to customers said, hey, how would you like your, to cook your Christmas dinner for free? We'll give you four hours during this time if you cook your Christmas dinner at this time and use more energy during this period. I was really successful. A lot of people did it, uh, but it was kind of a one-shot, one-off thing. So the next question was like, okay, will people do it if it's a regular occurrence? So we ran something called Power Hour, and this is where once a week we would pick a random time of the day, give people 24 hours notice and say, are you going to get one hour of free energy if you shift your usage and use more at this time? Again, really successful. It worked. Um, so you flip it on its head. Okay, will people use less energy if they're paid for it? Tell them to turn the lights and the TV off. Uh, and we ran a couple of campaigns to do that, uh, both with electricity and with gas. That's the difference between the big daily turn down and, and winter workout. And eventually we ran saving sessions, which was a national the uh, national grid was involved. Uh, they asked from our results that we'd sent them from our testing, they decided to launch this na nationally. They invited all energy suppliers to take part. Of course, because we tested it and broke it down, we launched, we were able to launch ours first. And I think of everybody that took part across the UK, 60, 65% of everybody who took part were Optus energy customers. And I'm pleased to say we're launching saving sessions uh, version two this year with even more added features, uh, a reward system called Opto Points uh, that's really exciting, gives more people options on things they can choose. They can choose their own rewards, so it's not always specifically cash based. Um, yes, so that's saving sessions. That's a quick rundown of sort of how the culture and how we prioritize everything to focus on customer look and customer growth. So I don't know if we have any questions. Yeah, bro, that was great. Thank you both so much. Um, yeah, as uh, Max just mentioned, and I said earlier, um, please do add any questions to the chat or the Q&A um, that you should be able to find at the bottom of your screen. Um, I can see we've had a few, of it, few through already, so I'll dive straight into those. Um, the first one, uh, it's for you, Stu. Um, it says you've listed three strategies for prioritizing, but what would be your recommended approach? Um, so I think I said that pro I'd probably avoid the first one about playing it safe. Um, but the the one I'd probably recommend, and it's not just because Max is here, but is, is that kind of third one of breaking it down. 
um, I think firstly, you know, it allows you to remain competitive um, in the long term, but also you're learning much earlier from real customers in, in the market. Um, but it probably is the most challenging one to achieve, you know, for all the reasons that Max went through, went through. you know, you need to have the right culture, you need technology in place um, and, and the right kind of yeah, mindset within the organization, which, which can be hard to achieve. But yeah, the third one would be my preference. Ah, thank you. Um, I think we've just had um, a follow up question to that. It's, um, that is, how do you identify the capabilities needed to deliver these strategies? How do you identify the capabilities? Yeah, needed to deliver these strategies. Um, what well, within your? I'm not sure. I quite follow within your own organisation or? Yeah, I believe so. Um, I think it's from Leanne. So Leanne, if you kind of have anything specific you wanted to add to that. Um, and then should we jump to the next one? Well, um, maybe Leanne, you could add some extra detail and then she can also you can have a think about it. Yeah. Um, the next one we've got is for you, Max, actually. Um, oh, sorry. Leanne just said, yes, it's within the organization. So the capabilities within the, or within the organization. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I, I guess a this is me pushing our own tools, but you know we, we have a customer centricity survey um, where you kind of it asks you a bunch of questions um, that identifies things like how capable are you in you know in, in empowerment of your team or your technology or um, yeah and your your capability to do research. So that that's maybe one way to kind of identify the, the capabilities. Um, yeah, I'm not sure whether that helps. Uh um, okay, if we move on to the next one, I think this one's for you, Max. Um, it says, how do you stop Octopus from falling into chaos if anyone can do anything they like? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we get that quite often, actually. And I think it, it really comes down to two things. Uh, the first one, and probably the most important, is, is recruitment. Uh, you know, there are, I think there are very specific type of people who actually thrive in these environments. Uh, people who understand sort of the rationality of human, their own human behavior almost. Um, and secondly, no one's in a position to be able to, to flatten the business. I think it's, I think it's human nature, especially sort of within Western society to, to want to control and force things to be a certain way. And I always think, so I'm not a parent. I don't have, I don't have kids, but uh, I've got a lot of nieces and nephews. I've got a lot of friends uh, with children. And I always, I think the most stressful ones are the ones who try and force the kid to be a certain way, almost those high helicopter parents hovering over them. The parents are most stressed, the kid's most unhappy. And actually, it's the ones who kind of give their kid freedom to run around, you know, make their own mistakes. And usually, you know, you wouldn't let them run near a cliff edge or around a fire, but actually giving them the freedom to do stuff and make mistakes. You know, maybe they'll eat a bit of dirt and a worm and quickly learn that that doesn't taste nice but actually it's a learning for them and probably you're learning for the immune system as well so it's a good way to de uh, to develop so so with that analogy it's sort of letting people be themselves but at the same time you know putting those metaphorical barriers near the cliff edge so nobody can click a button that would just take the business down you know for example there are, there are certain people who are allowed to publicly talk to the press and make TV appearances and stuff like this who have undergone sort of, you know, PR training. Uh, so nobody can jump in and say something that's wrong or, you know, some erroneous stuff. Um, and just come back to the equipment, I think it comes down to, there's this analogy that's thrown around quite a lot and it comes to like forcing people into these bricks. And it's a, the stone wall analogy where in the, in the countryside in England, you have these stone walls that have lasted centuries and they don't use cement and they all have these different sized stones. And what you do with these stones is you find the perfect place where they fit and going to hold the wall in place. And I think that what a lot of corporations do is actually want you to fit into a certain way of working and they chisel off everything that makes you brilliant, all your brilliant ideas and forces you into this box. Um, which really you know, kills diversity, creativity. And actually, if you could just find, take people's brilliance um, 
And the only way to do that is, is to let them run around and find where they can do their best work. Does that, hopefully that, that answer the question? Yeah, perfect, thank you. Um, we've probably got time for one more. Um, so um, I'll go with this one, I think. Um, that I think is um, aimed at you, Stu, um, but Max, feel free to chip in if, if you'd like to. Um, but how do I go about selling in um, a different strategy, e.g. breaking it down uh, to decision makers? They just want to play it safe. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that partly the white paper that we produce um, could be a tool for that. You know, we've got some evidence in there that, that hopefully supports that strategy. Um, and yeah, stories from from organisations like um, Octopus that that kind of back up that that finding as well. Um, but I mean, probably, you know, taking that strategy as well and trying to break it down. You know, so is there a, a you know, at CX we often try and run pilot programs to test new ways of working. So if you can persuade someone to kind of try a different way of working on a particular project or initiative um and then seeing how that works and and kind of capturing it and sharing the learnings is, is probably a good way as well yeah. fab okay great um so yeah we've got a couple minutes um just to wrap up um but as i mentioned earlier as attendees of this webinar we wanted to give you all exclusive early access to the white paper that um she just mentioned and we've been talking about in this session um so i'll just share it in the chat now um, and you should all be able to download it from that link. Um, and I've also shared a link to the rest of the session. So if you're not signed up already, uh, please do sign up to the rest of those. Um, yeah, and I, finally, I just want to say thank you so much for today's session, Max and Stu. It was super interesting and there was some really great insights in there. Um, and also a huge thank you to everyone for coming along. We'd love to hear your feedback. Um, and so, yeah, please drop us a message. Um, with any of your thoughts and then we also really hope to see you at next week's talk um yeah thanks everyone um i hope you have thank a nice you lauren. Lauren, thanks everyone bye pleasure take care